Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll listen again to Jesus' parable of the tenants in Matthew chapter 21. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. The Gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, this is a story about people who hate Jesus. They're described in the parable as, as delusional, against all reason. They kick and scream against the Almighty as if this is a fight they can win. King Manasseh was one of those Jesus haters. He was happy to worship just about anything as long as it wasn't God. He, he built altars to other gods inside God's temple where God had said, that's where my name belongs. Forgive the comparison, but that's like a husband making his wife sleep on the floor to make room for his mistress in their bed. He worshipped the, the stars. He hired devil worshippers as his senior advisors. Maybe it was they who suggested that he offer his son as a burnt sacrifice. In any case, that's what he did. The reign of Manasseh overlapped with the ministry of the prophet Isaiah, that prophet who sang beautiful songs about the Savior, that he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Remember the prophet Isaiah? You know how he died? Jewish historians tell us that King Manasseh had him cut in half with a tree saw. When, when the Israelites first took conquest of the promised land, God described it as a cleansing. By their conquest, he was purging the land of the evil nations that had lived there before the Israelites. But then Manasseh came 700 years after the conquest, and it was worse than it was before they moved in. They were piling up their sins into mountains. And if the pile of their sins was like Mount McKinley before Manasseh took office, he ramped it up to Mount Everest. So finally God said, I've had enough. I will wipe Jerusalem, wipe out Jerusalem as one wipes out a dish, wiping it out and turning it upside down. Manasseh and others of his ilk, they're in this story that Jesus told about people who hate Jesus, who kick and scream against the Almighty as if it's a fight they can win. But by the time Jesus told this story 700 years after Manasseh, it had gotten even worse. They were about to graduate from killing God's prophets into killing God's son. And here's the scary part. Take a close look 
at the people whose crimes are about to make Manasseh look like a softy. Verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. The most wretched wretches in Jesus' story are the pastors. And here's the even scarier part. They don't take Jesus' story to heart. They don't repent. Four days before they murder Jesus, Jesus, Jesus warns them and pleads with them to recognize what they're about to do. And you know what? It, it only makes them want to do it even more. The only reason that they don't take Jesus into custody right then and there is that they're afraid. Not afraid of God. No, they're about to kill God. They're afraid of the people. I, I think that we're familiar enough with the New Testament that when we hear the terms chief priests and Pharisees that we automatically think bad guys. But but let's be careful about imagining people who are just so appalling that there could never be any comparison to us. So when you hear chief priests and Pharisees, don't picture them as, as monsters who are already twirling their mustaches in kindergarten and whose parents were secretly worried about the kinds of crimes that they might have committed when they grew up. These were the people that when they were kids, that they didn't get into any trouble. They handed in their homework on time. You asked them what they wanted to be when they were in kindergarten, and they'd say, I want to be a pastor. And that's exactly what they became. Even, even Manasseh, his father, was good King Hezekiah, one of the most godly kings that Jerusalem had seen. And granted, that's a pretty low bar for a king of Jerusalem, but I think that it's safe to assume that by the time Manasseh took the throne, that he had just completed the Jewish form, form of confirmation class. And, and I think it's safe to assume that when he was 12 years old, he would not have been able to dream that he would sacrifice his son in a fire and cut a prophet in two with a tree saw. My point is, is that we need to beware of looking at appalling people, whether in the Bible or in the present day, and jumping to the conclusion, well, I could never do something like that. Because the Bible and history are full of people who have thought the exact same thing and proved themselves wrong. Mountains of sin and unbelief are rarely built overnight. Far more often, it's one layer at a time. At first, it doesn't seem like much, that foundational layer. It's wide and it's long and it's not very high. And you look at it and think, oh, that's not a big deal. And, and then if you feel like you really don't have all that much to repent of, um, then you don't take repentance seriously. Because, hey, is it really a problem if I have it under control? But that's not the way sin works, is it? We don't control it. It controls us, and not like an external force working against our will from the outside. No, it consumes our will from the inside. Did you, did you notice how it grew in Jesus' parable throughout the history of Israel? It's, it started with the servants, the tenants seizing the servants, because they, they thought that the fruit of the vineyard should belong to them, it escalates into murdering the son because they think that the whole vineyard should belong to them. And they're convinced that they're in the right and hate anybody who would say otherwise. When Jesus shows the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees what they look like from the outside, they can see it 
crystal clear. Therefore, he asks them, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? And it's easy peasy. He will, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. But even so, when, when Jesus brings it full circle back to them, and they realize that he's talking about them, they, they double down. It's like they're standing defiantly, defiantly on top of a mountain of their own rebellion and saying to Jesus, you are never going to take this away from us. And then by the end of the week, they're standing proud at the foot of Jesus' cross, convinced that they won. It's a story that Jesus tells to pastors. And as far as I know, I'm the only pastor here. So I've got to ask myself first. Am I walking down that road? Talking about Jesus all day long and, and condemning everybody else's sin while at the same time I'm building up a mountain of my own. Because you know, it's, it's one thing to talk to you about our need to repent. It's another thing for me to take that seriously and recognize my own personal need to repent. But I'm not just a pastor. I'm also your pastor. So I need to ask the question of you too. Could you be going down that road? Whether, whether it's in the form of standing defiantly atop a mountain of, of obvious unbelief like Manasseh. Or whether it's standing defiantly upon a mountain of self-righteous unbelief wrapped up under a cloak of false piety like the chief priests and the Pharisees. You know, they're the exact same mountain. They were all Jesus haters because they were all sinning and refusing to repent. So, let me tell you what happened to Manasseh. We read from 2 Kings chapter 21. The rest of the story is in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. So, he had turned God's temple into an all-you-can-worship buffet of idolatry. He had sacrificed his son in the fire. And whenever God sent prophets, he, he rejected them, refused to listen, cut him in half. And finally God said, enough. And God sent an enemy army. And they put a hook through Manasseh's nose the same way that a man puts a leash on a dog, and they literally dragged him away to Babylon. And then, Second Chronicles 33, And then in his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, Manasseh repented. He recognized his vile nature and he turned to the God who forgives. And guess what God did? He forgave. And I hope that's not at all offensive to you because that's at the heart of of the Bible's message. Look at Jesus' parable again. It's not only the evil tenants who act contrary to all reason. Look at the owner of the vineyard. How many servants does he send to collect his fruit no matter how many times they're rejected and murdered and the violence only grows Bigger. And after sending how many servants who are all rejected and murdered, he, he sends his son 
into the lion's den? Does he really think that they're going to respect his son? God knew what they were going to do to Jesus, and Jesus knew it too. And he still went. Not because he didn't know what he was getting himself into, but because that's the price that God was determined to pay to redeem people who hated Jesus. That's the same thing that was driving God to keep sending his prophets to his people in the Old Testament throughout their history. It was love. It was always love. He, God sees people despising him, standing obstinately on the, on the mountains of their own rebellion and sin. And he loves them to send prophets, to send messengers, to call them away from their death to repentance. But those same objects of God's love, they saw it altogether different. They saw it every time as, well, here's another one that God is sending to get us. And so they refused to listen, and they rejected them, and they killed them. But against all reason, against all reason, God keeps sending He doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then when he finally sends his son, the ultimate act of love, the, the one who's not only going to preach their restoration to God, but the one who's going to accomplish their restoration to God, they look at him and it's even worse. Here God goes again. And they hang him on a tree high fives, smiles all around when they do. But here's the thing. Jesus still dies for them. They, they, they hang him on a tree. They're all grins. And while they're doing that, Jesus is dying on that tree to pay for their sins of hanging him on a tree. How do you read the sermon theme that's printed in the service folder? God sends his son. He comes for me. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? When the chief priests and the Pharisees encountered that truth, their, their hatred just burned. And Jesus' warning was real. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And anyone who fights against it will be broken to pieces and crushed forever. But when God sends his spirit into your heart to open up your eyes to his love in that statement, when God sends his son, he comes for me even for me, then that's the most precious thing that God has ever done, and it's marvelous in your eyes. That Jesus came for you. Whatever the size of the mountain of the sin underneath your feet, that however boldly you've stood on top of it and, and hated God for talking about it, that Jesus came not only for everyone, but for you, and took away that mountain of guilt from beneath your feet and set you firmly and squarely on himself, the cornerstone. This story 
isn't only about people who hate Jesus. This story is about Jesus who dies for haters. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The Lord has done this, and may it ever be marvelous in our eyes. Amen.